In this video, we're going to be doing another electrophysiology problem, but this time it's going to be about thresholds and length constants. So let's look at the problem. We have a neuron with a potassium channel conductance of 10 nanosiemens, a chloride channel conductance of 6 nanosiemens, and a sodium channel conductance of 1 nanosiemens when the cell is at rest. This first figure shows the fold increase in the sodium channel conductance when none of the voltage-gated sodium channels are initially inactivated. So basically you start out at a really negative voltage, say negative 100 millivolts, and you temporarily bump up the voltage in varying steps. And then you measure the maximum sodium channel conductance corresponding to each step. And this is the graph that you get when you plot the sodium channel conductance in those experiments as a function of that voltage step. Note that the right panel is just a zoomed in version of the left one. This second figure here shows the steady state and activation curve of those sodium channels. Here what's different is that you keep the voltage depolarized for a long time instead of temporarily like in figure 1 and measure the fraction of channels that are not inactivated. So for instance if you stay depolarized at minus 40 millivolts only 5% of your voltage gated sodium channels won't be inactivated which means that 95% of your channels will be inactivated. You also assume that the potassium and chloride channels aren't voltage gated, so their conductance stays constant. Now the first part asks you the fraction of voltage gated sodium channels inactivated at resting potential. How you would go about finding this is you would first determine the resting potential and then use figure 2 here to find the fraction of voltage gated sodium channels that are inactivated. The resting potential can be found very easily, just use the weighted average of the equilibrium potentials these E's over here, just use the weighted average of these E's of the conducting channels. So the weights in this weighted average are the conductances of the channels. If you plug in the values, then the nano semen units cancel out and you'll get a resting potential of negative 65 millivolts. Now when your resting potential is negative 65 millivolts, then you're pretty much at steady state. Resting potentials aren't temporary, they're there as long as the cell is at rest. So at the resting potential, we can go to figure 2 and see that for negative 65 millivolts, 55% of the channels are not inactivated. That's what it means when it says closed. It's not inactivated. But the question is asking us for the percentage of channels that are inactivated. So what we would do is we would just do 100 minus 55, which is 45%. So at the resting potential, at negative 65 millivolts, we conclude that 45% of the channels are inactivated. The second part of the question is a bit longer. What it says is that the same neuron has two excitatory synapses on two different dendrites. So you can imagine one branch for dendrite A with a synapse A coming in and another branch for dendrite B with synapse B coming in. Synapse A is located at a distance of XA equals 300 microns from the cell body while synapse B is located at a distance of XB equals 150 microns from the cell body. The membrane resistance is 5000 ohm centimeter squared, while the cytoplasmic resistance is 200 ohm centimeters. Finally, the diameters of dendrites A and B are 1 micron and 2 micron respectively. So here's the question. If synapses A and B receive EPSPs, that is excitatory postsynaptic potentials, if synapses A and B receive those EPSPs at the same time, with synapse A receiving a 10 millivolt EPSP, what is the minimum EPSP required at synapse B for the neuron to fire an action potential? We're assuming that the EPSPs from both synapse A and B travel down the dendrite and arrive at the cell body at the same time. So the situation looks something like this, and you want to find the EPSP required over here to get the neuron to fire an action potential. But first we need to know how much depolarization is required over here at the cell body to get the neuron to start firing. So the first thing we do is figure out the threshold of the neuron. This is the depolarization level beyond which the neuron fires an action potential. Now you know from the previous video that the threshold occurs when the currents going into the cell exceed the currents going out of the cell. Note that currents are used to represent the flow of positive charge. So an inward current would mean sodium ions flowing into the cell and is also equivalent to negative charge moving out of the cell. When this condition occurs, the neuron enters a positive feedback cycle in which more positive charge enters the cell 
voltage rises, more sodium channels open because sodium channels open when voltage goes up. And when those sodium channels open, even more positive charge starts entering the cell, causing the voltage to rise even more, and then the cycle keeps continuing until we get an action potential. In this case, the inward currents are the sodium currents, and the outward currents are the potassium and chloride currents. You could argue that chloride is actually an inward current when the neuron is below negative 60 millivolts, but when we talk about finding threshold in this example, we're primarily going to be looking at larger voltages, so voltages above negative 60 millivolts, where the chloride current will be an outward current. Now, since the graphs are our main pieces of information, we'll have to use a trial and error method to find a threshold. Now for trial and error, you can start your voltage guess for the threshold. You can start that guess anywhere, and then you can make additional guesses for the threshold based on the results you get for your first guesses. So let's guess a threshold of minus 45 millivolts. At minus 45 millivolts, the sodium current is just the conductance of the sodium ions at minus 45 millivolts times the driving force. Now at minus 45, a depolarization will increase the sodium conductance by a factor of 9.5 if we go all the way up here to figure 1. Since the original conductance was 1 nanosiemens, our new conductance at minus 45 millivolts will be 9.5 nanosiemens. However, figure 1 represents the fold increase from rest when none of the sodium channels were initially inactivated. But we already know that 55% of sodium channels were not inactivated at a resting potential of minus 65 millivolts. There was still a sizable fraction, a 45% fraction, that was inactivated at the resting potential of minus 65 millivolts. So we need to take this fold increase of 9.5 and multiply it by 0.55, since only 55% of the voltage-gated sodium channels are available to conduct current. The other 45% are inactivated, so they can't do anything. When we do that, the current we get for sodium is about minus 496 picoamps. It's negative because positive charge is going inwards. Remember, negative currents mean positive charge is going inwards, and then positive currents mean positive charge is going outwards. This is the sign convention for cell currents. We can also find the outward currents, potassium and chloride. For potassium, we just have 350 picoamps, and for the chloride current, we have 90 picoamps. Notice that the conductances for these two don't change because the question specified that they stay constant. The total outward current is just the sum of these two and is thus IK plus ICL, which is 440 picoamps. Now if we compare the inward and the outward currents, we find that the magnitude of the inner current is 496 picoamps, while the magnitude of the outward current is 440 picoamps. So that means we're actually slightly past the threshold. And since we're past threshold and not as close as we would like, we can make another guess in the trial and error method by picking a slightly lower voltage, like minus 46 millivolts. We're going lower because with minus 45 we were above threshold, so now we have to make a lower guess to get closer to the threshold. The procedure for finding the inward and outward currents now is still the exact same, except now the VMs in the current equation are all replaced by minus 46 millivolts, and the 9.5 fold increase in the sodium conductance becomes an 8 fold increase if you go back to figure 1 here. If we make all the relevant substitutions, we'll find that the sodium current now becomes negative 418 picoamps, while the potassium and chloride currents become 340 and 84 picoamps respectively. The total outward current is now 424 picoamps, just add 340 to 84 while the magnitude of the inward current is now 418 picoamps. So now the inward current is slightly lower than the outward current, which means we're slightly below threshold. So we could see that at minus 45 millivolts we were above threshold, and at minus 46 millivolts we're slightly below threshold. So the actual threshold is somewhere in between. Now since the two currents were very, very close to each other, for minus 46 millivolts the only difference is 6 picoamps, which isn't very much, the threshold we can conclude is actually closer to minus 46 than to minus 45. In fact, it's safe to say that the threshold is just minus 46 millivolts. It's a good enough guess. So now we've found the threshold. If the cell starts out at a resting potential of minus 65 millivolts, what that means is we're going to have to depolarize it by 19 millivolts 
to get to minus 46 millivolts, which is the threshold, and to get an action potential. Now let's look at how much synapse A, whose EPSP value we know, let's look at how much synapse A contributes to the depolarization of the cell body. To do this, we'll have to use this length equation for the voltage. What this equation just says is that if a signal propagates along a neuron, the strength of the signal will decrease the further it propagates because it will lose energy along the way. Note that V0 is the stimulus at x equals 0, x is the distance from the site of the original stimulus, and lambda is the length constant of that dendrite. Now for synapse A, we know the initial stimulus, which is just 10 millivolts. We know the distance of synapse A from the cell body, which is 300 microns, but we don't know the length constant of dendrite A. However, we can find that just by using this equation. Lambda A equals the square root of Rm times R sub A over 2 times rho, where Rm is the membrane resistance, small r sub A is the radius of that dendrite A, and rho is the cytoplasm resistivity. We already know what all these values are, so we can just plug them in. Note that the radius of dendrite A is just half its diameter. Since the diameter was 1 micron, the radius is obviously half a micron. Note also that the length units aren't consistent in this equation, so we're going to have to convert centimeters to microns, or we can convert the micron to centimeter, but we have to maintain consistency. Now when we do all that, we'll find that the length constant of dendrite A is 250 microns. Anyway, now that we have the length constant for dendrite A, we can find the depolarization at the cell body of the neuron as a result of the EPSP that occurs at synapse A. To do that, we just apply this voltage length equation, and we get 3.01 millivolts. So synapse A depolarizes the cell body by 3.01 millivolts. That means the depolarization at the cell body required from synapse B is just the depolarization needed to fire an action potential, which is 19 millivolts, minus the depolarization we already have from synapse A. So the depolarization needed from synapse B at the cell body is 15.99 millivolts. Now we can use the same voltage length equation for the stimulus from synapse B, except now we have to find the EPSP value at the site of the original stimulus because we already have the value at the cell body, it's 15.99 millivolts. Now to get this V sub naught B, we first need to find the length constant lambda B, which is very similar to how we found lambda A, except now the only difference is that the radius is one micron instead of half a micron, because the diameter of dendrite B was two microns. If we do that, we'll get 353.55 microns for the length constant, and plugging that all into the VB equation, we'll get V naught B equals 24.44 millivolts. So finally, the EPSP necessary at synapse B to get the cell body to fire an action potential is 24.44 millivolts. So we're done. And that should be it for this video. Thanks for watching.